So the uh, next presentation will be presented by Dr. Aaron Slomovich and uh, Andre Iliotu on uh, sclerotherapy. And, um, and Dr. Slomovich is an assistant professor of uh, Department of Radiology and General Surgery at uh, University Health Network. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pei. It's always uh, an honor. Uh, this is my disclosure, un unrelated to anything we'll talk about uh, today. So, um, as opposed to the lecture we just had, which was very, uh, I guess, on the uh, biochemistry mechanism, this is a much more of a, a view from uh, 10,000 feet of, uh, of uh, autosomal dominant uh, polycystic kidney disease. So, in theory, the, uh, these uh, cysts uh, enlarge, they cause local mass effect uh, on the uh, normal renal parenchyma. Uh, they cause some uh, is local ischemia, theoretically some obstruction at the, uh, at the uh, nephron level, which results over time in deterioration in kidney function. So, the whole idea behind uh, polycystic uh, uh, kidney disease is can we uh, reduce the, uh, the size of the cysts in these, uh, in these kidneys, and can we uh, help uh, preserve the uh, kidney function over time? Now, as was mentioned uh, earlier in this morning, there's, you know, this is still, a, I guess, an investigational procedure for polycystic kidney disease. There's a lot that we don't know, but uh, we've been doing it for almost four years now, and we certainly learned quite a lot, and our technique has evolved. So I'll, uh, I'll try and touch on that uh, during the presentation. I'll focus much more on the technical aspects of the procedure, and, uh, and Andre will, uh, will follow up on the kind of clinical aspects uh, uh, right after. So percutaneous sclerotherapy is not, is not particularly new. People have tried to drain cysts in the kidneys for, for a long time. Uh, we know that uh, just draining the cyst fluid, just aspirating the cyst fluid is not uh, good enough. The uh, cyst will accumulate, reaccumulate. So really what you need to do is uh, try and target the epithelium and uh, destroy the, the cyst wall in a sense to get it to, uh, to collapse. The, there's various agents that have been uh, reported in the, in the literature as far as what's, what, what to use for these sclerotherapy procedures. Uh, alcohol is a common uh, agent that's used. We've moved away from using alcohol mainly because alcohol is quite uh, painful for patients. Uh, STS, sodium tetradiacyl sulfate, is much uh, uh, better tolerated. It's essentially a, a detergent. Uh, and it's used uh, very commonly for treating lymphatic malformations, venous malformations. So this is an off-label use uh, uh, for uh, STS, but uh, like I said, we've been using it for quite a while now and uh, appears to have a very good safety profile. The other thing is that the approved dose for STS is up to about uh, 10, uh, 10 mils of the 3% uh, STS per session. Uh, but that's for uh, intravascular use. We don't really know what the maximal uh, dose that we can use in these cysts is. Uh, so we've, over time, have increased the dose. Uh, so if you were here three years ago, we were using up to 10 mils, same as approved. And uh, we have gradually, over the years, have increased. And, uh, and now we're using tw up to 20 cc's per session, which allows us to treat uh, bigger cysts, more cysts at a time, and uh, do in one stage what in the past we did in, in a couple stages. So basically, the, the way the procedure works uh, is it's an outpatient uh, procedure. They come in in the morning. They get admitted uh, through, our, uh, through our unit. They come into the room. The procedure is done under conscious sedation, just uh, versed and fentanyl, uh, primarily under ultrasound guidance with some fluoro. And I'll, I'll touch on the radiation levels afterwards. Very, very low. Mostly, it's an ultrasound guided procedure. Uh, we started primarily using a Seldinger technique and then moved more towards uh, doing a trocar technique. Uh, I think trocar technique has some advantages uh, in the fact that uh, the 
uh, sort of the opening in the cyst around the, uh, around the catheter itself is a bit tighter, and we think there's less extravasation of, of uh, the sclerosin to the, to the retroperitoneum. So we've seen the rates of post-procedural uh, post pain uh, go down. Uh, so this is, you know, when we have good visibility and, uh, and uh, we're quite happy, then it would pre tend to use more of a trocar technique. As I said, for the foam, we use up to 20 cc's of the 3% STS. We combine it with room air, and we try and replace about 40 to 50 cc's of the volume that we, uh, that we remove. Uh, we don't want to over distend these cysts uh, because we don't want any foam to leak out. If you over distend the cyst, uh, patients can have some pain. Uh, so we only replace about 40 to 50 percent at max from, uh, from what we've taken out. And you don't want to do more than about one in 10 dilution of the, uh, of the STS with room air just because it doesn't form a, a very good foam if it's overly diluted. So this is a video of what it looks like. This is just scanning the patient. Patients are lying prone. Uh, you can see that we're going direct, we're going to go directly into the cyst itself. This is the local anesthetic uh, being infiltrated uh, and tends to be, the procedure itself is fairly painless uh, uh, for the patient. We try not to cross any, any normal renal parenchyma. Uh, you can advance uh, forward. So this is the uh, catheter that uh, we use. Uh, it's a ten, uh, sorry, a six French, uh, six French catheter. Uh, so just about uh, two millimeters or so. Uh, we insert it here under uh, ultrasound guidance, uh, direct puncture into the, uh, into the cyst itself. We try not to cross any normal kidney parenchyma at all, just go directly into the cyst. We form, there's a little pigtail that will form at the end of the, uh, of the uh, catheter to keep, keep it in place while the procedure is getting done, and especially if uh, these patients are gonna have a two-stage procedure and go home with the catheter. As you can see here, the pigtail is getting formed, and uh, now we're basically going to uh, suck out the fluid. So uh, depending on the volume, we pretty typically would use one of these uh, vacutainer bottles that I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, suck out the fluid, assess how much volume we have, and according to that, uh, we'll decide uh, the amount of uh, uh, foam to, to inject. The main thing to do is to make sure the cyst is completely collapsed. So we try not to keep it open to room air because especially with a bigger cyst, they'll tend to suck in, uh, suck in air from the outside, partially re-expand, and then you don't get as good of a contact of the foam with the, uh, with the side wall of the cyst. So we, we try to keep it always uh, closed. So you can see here the cyst is completely collapsed now. This is the, uh, our uh, vials of uh, STS. Uh, we just showing you we're mixing it with just one syringe with room air, one syringe with the STS, and just mixing it through a three-way three uh, uh, valve to uh, create this kind of whitish foam. Uh, and then we are going to be re-injecting it. You see the cyst is re-expanding uh, with the foam. Uh, and then uh, what we do next, this is what it looks like under fluoro. Uh, we close it, patient goes to the uh, recovery room. What they do in the recovery room is that they kind of rotate in bed about a quarter turn every, uh, every 15 minutes or so for about an hour to try and get optimal coating of the uh, cyst wall. I don't know how uh, uh, necessary that is, but that's uh, it's been our protocol and we haven't changed it. I think um, the, the majority of the effect is on the immediate contact of the foam with the cyst wall, but Either way, we still do it. Uh, after uh, about uh, an hour of the patient uh, doing those quarter turns in bed, uh, we connect the uh, drain up to a drainage bag, and give it a, about a half an hour of passive drainage, allow whatever is left of the foam and the cyst fluid to come out. Uh, this pinkish, uh, is typically this kind of pinkish appearance to it. Uh, and then after about half an hour, we suck out whatever is left over and, uh, and uh, we take out the uh, catheter if it's going to be a single stage procedure. Like I said, I think uh, uh, doing this kind of half hour passage drainage is pretty useful. Uh, they get a lot less pain if you allow everything to drain out well. Uh, what we had in the past when we used to just cut out, cut the drain and remove it would be some foam sort of leaking along the track and patients would get pain. So like I said, just these few modifications have really reduced the, the rates of pain post-procedure. So uh, just to show you how the uh, sclerosant works, this is just a, kind of a, a, you know, 
know, electron microscopy uh, model. This is actually a vascular epithelium showing that it basically destroys the, the phospholipid uh, uh, layer and destroys the, the epithelium. We've done our own study uh, using a, a pig bladder as a, as a model for uh, sclerosin just to see how these uh, uh, the sclerosin uh, works. So this is uh, the pig bladder dissected out. Uh, with a, basically a port inserted into it, and we've injecting, we're injected the, the foam. And, and what we find is this. So this is sort of pre-sclerotherapy. You see this nice epithelial layer, and then post-sclerotherapy, it all washes out. And if you look, this is not the greatest picture. In the crypts, uh, you can see a little bit of epithelium that's left over that didn't come in contact with the, uh, with the STS. And that's why we think uh, also for when you do it, uh, obviously in patients, is to try and get the cyst as fully collapsed as possible so when you inject the foam, it comes immediately in contact with the entire wall. Uh, and then there's really not much uh, destruction to anything around it. There's a little bit of uh, uh, venous congestion uh, in, the, um, in the, uh, some of the superficial uh, uh, veins uh, near the area but not, uh, not much in the way of, uh, of destruction deep to just the epithelial layer. So this is uh, um, um, uh, laser endomicroscopy, also in the same uh, pig bladder. You can see uh, this is what it looks like normally with some uh, very superficial or kind of capillary uh, blood flow. And then uh, post-sclerotherapy, basically everything is uh, uh, destroyed uh, uh, superficially. So this is our uh, current protocol. Like I said, patients rotate about 90 degrees every 15 minutes uh, uh, for about an hour. Uh, if the cysts are small, less than about seven centimeters, this is uh, kind of an arbitrary cutoff that uh, we've decided, but seems to have some, uh, uh, some benefit to it. Uh, so cysts that are levers, uh, less than seven centimeters, we'll treat them as a one stage, meaning the patient comes in, have the procedure done, catheter is removed, they go home without anything the same day. If the cysts are bigger than seven centimeters, now probably bigger than eight centimeters, just because we're using higher doses of, of the STS, uh, we do a two-stage procedure, meaning that they come in, they have the drain inserted, uh, we do the first part of the sclerotherapy, they go home with a drain and a bag and come back uh, several days later to have a second session and then we remove everything after the second, uh, the second procedure. So this is uh, some of our data, and this is specifically uh, looking at the, uh, the cyst volume. This is not total kidney volume, this is cyst volume, and the cyst that was treated. Uh, so this is uh, sort of all our patients uh, pre and post sclerotherapy. You can see you can get about a 90% reduction in the size of the cyst that you treated. Uh, this is just patients that we have long-term follow-up on, so uh, patients that we have over a year follow-up, and you can see that the response is, uh, is sustained. Uh, so they, you know, we have almost, uh, on some patients, three years of follow-up uh, data, and, and you can see they don't reaccumulate in the cyst itself. Now, obviously, the cysts around uh, grow because it's a you know, progressive disease, but the cyst that was treated uh, does, not, does not appear to regrow. This is looking at uh, single stage versus uh, two-stage two procedure, and I'm sorry that the uh, the numbers didn't uh, come out right here. But uh, basically, uh, you get about a 90 percent. This is 90 percent. This is an 89 percent uh, reduction. Uh, obviously, for a single stage, the starting volume is uh, is lower. Uh, for the uh, two-stage, the starting volume is, uh, is much higher, uh, but uh, if you do the two-stage uh, uh, procedure, you can still get uh, about a 90% reduction in cyst volume, even for these uh, quite large cysts. So this is just some examples of, of some patients to look at kind of pre and post uh, uh, sclerotherapy. So, uh, you can see here in the, uh, the pre-MRI, uh, very large, very central cysts, and then post-procedure, you can see these have uh, shrunk down, and uh, you know, it's kudos to uh, uh, some of our fellows that have done this analysis, because it can be quite, uh, quite difficult to uh, identify the, the, the right cyst, because sometimes you see almost nothing. This is a pretty uh, typical kind of post-sclerotherapy. Uh, you get this uh, dense, uh, 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 ring on the, on the post-procedure T2 uh, uh, image, but you can see pretty uh, striking uh, uh, decrease in the size of the cyst, and obviously the kidney morphology can, uh, changes uh, and, and normalizes at least a little bit. Okay, 
we uh, move to the next uh, slide? Oh, perfect. This is another uh, patient. Uh, we treated the uh, left-sided uh, cyst here. You can see very giant cyst kidneys uh, displaced anteriorly. And uh, this is on uh, post uh, uh, follow-up. Uh, cyst is definitely much smaller, and the kidneys are more in a more normal position. You can see in in uh, in contrast the cyst on the contralateral kidney that wasn't treated, uh, just showing a little bit of uh, interval uh, increase in size. Uh, click. Oh, perfect. So just to show you, this is very very uh, preliminary data and some uh, study that we're just starting, which is. Uh, Actually, I think uh, a little bit exciting. So uh, what we're doing uh, here and what we've done in these eight patients uh, so far is uh, we uh, uh, got the intracystic uh, pressure. So we basically uh, uh, get the uh, pressure inside the cyst before their sclerotherapy, and then we measure it again for uh, a period of time after the sclerotherapy. We basically uh, I think that at the moment, at least, this is the best uh, surrogate that we have for pressure uh, in the area of the kidney around the cyst itself. Uh, so uh, what you can see here, this is uh, baseline. These are not absolute values. This is a decrease from baseline. Uh, so before the sclerotherapy and then after the sclerotherapy, the, the red line is the average of the patients we have so far. You can see they get kind of immediate reduction uh, in pressure post after you suck out the fluid, which is uh, you know very um, uh, I guess logical. Uh, and then they get a little bit of uh, of recoil as the tissues uh, as the tissues uh, uh, recoil, so the the pressure sort of normalizes a little bit, but doesn't quite get back to baseline. Uh, for most patients, we have at least this is 10 minutes. 10 minutes worth of data, uh, but on a couple of patients, we have uh, data going out to about uh, 20 minutes. Uh, and you can see that it doesn't see, even at 20 minute follow up, it doesn't quite seem to get back to baseline. So it's sort of our first indication that we, we it might be possible to reduce the, the, the pressure, at least in the uh, immediate uh, vicinity of the, uh, of the cyst. Now, the average uh, obviously kind of gets a bit uh, disorganized because we don't have as much data past, uh, past 10 minutes on most patients. Uh, but uh, at least on, on the couple patients that we have follow up out to 20 minutes, it seems to be sustained. Now, obviously, we don't know what happens in two hours. We don't know what happens in two weeks. Uh, but uh, it's our very first indication that we might be able to uh, uh, truly uh, decrease the, the pressure in the area related to these cysts. So technical parameters, uh, this uh, slide hasn't been updated in a little while. I can tell you that our mean fluoroscopic time is very low. This is very much sort of an early learning curve uh, effect here right now. Uh, we use, uh, I would say, uh, much less than about 30 seconds of, uh, of fluoro time per patient. It's really, we just inject a little bit of contrast to make sure that uh, there's no communication with the vein or with the collecting system. And uh, one last image at the end with the foam in place, but the, the fluoro time is, is extremely low. Uh, where we want to take this, I think there's a lot more to, to learn. I think at some point we'll be able to do it without uh, contrast and perhaps without even uh, any fluoro, just do it to, to strictly ultrasound guidance, which will obviously make it uh, cheaper, easier, and increase our, our throughput. Uh, we can probably reduce our post-procedure stay to less than the two hours that they stay right now to even a shorter amount of time. Um, uh, so in conclusion, 3% uh, STS foam sclerotherapy seems to be safe and efficacious, uh, at least as far as reducing the cyst volume. As I said, we don't truly know the effect on, on kidney function over time, and that's, uh, that remains to be uh, uh, determined. Our, our safety profile is quite good. I think Andre will touch on that. The, the, the risk seems to be uh, extremely low. If you look at per number of cysts done, probably around the 1% the, the uh, uh, mark. Uh, and then uh, for future studies, we definitely need to evaluate the, the effect on kidney perfusion and, uh, and renal function over time. So that's my, uh, that's my slides, and I think Andrew will touch on, uh, Andrew will touch on the uh, more clinical side.